This is the video lecture for Lesson 17 in Clayton Croy's A Primer to Biblical Greek. In this lesson, we will discuss third declension nouns. Let's begin with a brief review of nouns and what we've learned so far. We've learned two basic types of nouns so far. You'll remember that we've learned first declension nouns, which are mostly feminine and end in alpha or eta. We've also learned about second declension nouns, which again are mostly masculine or neuter, and they end in os or on. The two types of nouns that we've learned so far are formed fairly consistently. So as we move into third declension nouns, one of the things that we need to be aware of at the very beginning is that third declension nouns are way more weird. A little bit more about third declension nouns. Third declension nouns show the greatest variety in forms. They include all three genders. There are several different groups or subtypes of third declension nouns, and so memorizing them or getting a handle on them can be difficult. There are three characteristics to th third declension nouns. First of all, the gender cannot be determined from the basic form. That means, like with all of our nouns, you really need to be memorizing the definite article along with the nominative case of that noun. However, the stem cannot be known from the nominative, therefore you must also memorize the genitive. So in addition to memorizing the definite article, you also need to memorize the genitive form. Finally, the last part that makes third declension nouns weird is that the date of plural forms may vary. So in most cases, the genitive form gives you the basis for all the other forms, and that's why you need to memorize the genitive form in addition to the nominative case. Here's a chart with the basic endings of third declension nouns. Now remember, this has to be sort of prefaced with that reminder that third declension nouns are weird. So we may not always see these with third declension nouns, the examples that follow this basic chart, but in the nominative, you'll see a sigma at the end or nothing distinctive. At the genitive, you'll see an omicron sigma. In the dative singular, you'll see an iota. In the accusative singular, you'll see an alpha. And in the vocative, just like the nominative singular, you'll either see a sigma or nothing at all. In the plural, um, you will see the epsilon sigma ending. In the plural, you'll, plural genitive, you will see the omega nu ending. In the dative plural, you might see c or seen, uh, sigma iota nu. Uh, and in the plural accusative, you might see uh, alpha, sigma, or os. Um, and the vocative form generally will be the same as um, the nominative form. So let's start with some basic examples of these third declension nouns. The first one is arhon, arhontas, ha, or ha arhon, tu arhontas would be one way to think about memorizing these. And it, it is a ruler. So it's a masculine noun. And the only way that we know it's a masculine noun is because of that definite article, because we've memorized that definite article. And so here are the forms of the, uh, for the word arhon. So arhon, arhontas, arhonti, arhonta, arhon, arhontes, arhonton, arhusin, arhontas, arhontes. And you can see that that genitive singular gives us the basis for all but the dative plural forms. You see the um, ont in the middle and then the endings added. So uh, os in the genitive singular, i in the dative singular, a in the accusative singular, ace in the plural nominative, on in the plural genitive, and as in the plural accusative. And now, of course, this dative plural is, is just distinctive. It's, it's our, our weird one. So um, fortunately, uh, that sigma and the iota should be distinctive enough. And again, if you're able to see other clues in the sentence, that will help you as well. So here is another example. Uh, hey, sarks or tes, sarkas which is the Greek word for flesh. Again, this is a feminine noun, and the only way that we know that it's feminine is because of that definite article. 
Here then is a chart with the forms of the of of sarks, um, and you'll see that uh, sarks doesn't really help us. If we only memorize that nominative singular form, it will be difficult to recognize the other forms. But if we memorize the genitive as well, sarkas, then we can see sort of the the stem of the noun sark, and so uh, sarkas, sarki, sarka. Sarkes, sarcon, sarxin, sarkas. And two things to point out. One, you see consistently sort of the uh, sark stem and then these endings, that these basic endings of third declension nouns being added. And then with the dative plural, you can see that there is a xi there instead of a kappa. And this is the result of adding that sigma. It changes. So kappa plus the sigma results there in that xi. All right, here is another uh, Greek word. This time it is ta soma to somatas, which is the Greek word for body. It is a neuter noun, and it's neuter because that definite article tells us that it's neuter. So, soma, somatas, somati, soma, somata, somaton, somasin, somata. And so, once again, you can see that that genitive singular is key. It helps us see that the stem is not soma, but somat with, uh, with endings added on to that tau. So, uh, somatas, uh, and you can see those, those basic endings added for the genitive and the dative as uh, dative singular and then the genitive plural as well as the plural uh, nominative accusative and vocative which because this is a neuter noun are all three identical and again we have that sigma iota in the dative plural and here it doesn't it's not built onto that stem for the rest of the forms again Third declension nouns are just weird, but if we're looking for that sigma iota, sigma iota noon, it will help us uh, see that form. One last example, which is ta haima to haimatas, which is the Greek word for blood. Again, this is a neuter noun, and it's it, we know that it's neuter because we've memorized that definite article. So haima, haimatas, haimati, haima, haimata, haimaton, Haimasi, haimata. And so once again, as we've sort of gotten used to, that genitive singular gives us the basic stem, haimat, and then onto that we end the end we add the endings as, e, on uh, for the genitive and dative singular and the genitive plural. And then haimasin is this dative plural that um, is odd in comparison to those other forms. Um, and we would be, begin to recognize the C or scene ending as distinguishing it as the dative plural. So just a few more notes about third declension nouns. Remember that neuter nouns will be identical in the nominative, accusative, invocative forms, both for singular and plural. So it again is very important that you recognize when a noun is neuter uh, because it will have identical forms in those three different cases. You must, must, must memorize the genitive form. I cannot stress this enough. If you simply memorize the nominative form, you will not be able to recognize your third declension nouns. It's imperative that you that you memorize both the nominative and the, gen, uh, the genitive as well as the definite article for third declension nouns. Finally, as you come upon these in sentences, look for other clues in the sentence that can help you identify the number and case of third declension nouns. Because remember, as a noun, it will agree in number and in case and in gender with definite articles and with adjectives and so forth. So if you're able to use clues in the sentence, um, that will also help you work with these third declension nouns. All right, so let's get started with the first practice and review exercise. Ek tu stomatas tu didaskalu hemon ex erhontai tauta ta remata tes zoes. So, uh, as I have recommended, I would begin by bracketing off prepositional phrases and genitive phrases. So, ek tu stomatas 
to didaskalu hemon is one large um, phrase that we can bracket off. Ek tu stomatas is a prepositional phrase. And then tu didaskalu modifies stomatas and hemon modifies didaskalu. So then we're left with um, ex erhontai tauta taremata tes zoes. And of course, tes zoes is a genitive phrase that's modifying taremata. With those parts of the sentence bracketed off, let's identify the verb or verbs. And in this case, we only have one verb, and it's ex erhontai. And we would parse this as present deponent indicative third plural from ex erhomai. Um, and so it means we're looking for a plural subject. And here um, we're in luck, taremata is, uh, could be the accusative case, but in this case, uh, it's sort of what we're looking for in terms of a plural noun. Um, and so we're gonna take that as our subject in the nominative case rather than the accusative. We can identify or analyze these different nouns, these third declension nouns that we see in the sentence. The first one is tu stomatas, um, and you can see that it has that os ending, which is the genitive singular of third declension nouns. Um, it's from tastoma, which means mouth. And if, if you got held up on this one, you would recognize the definite article two um, in front of that word, which indicates that we are in a genitive singular. Uh, two could either indicate a masculine or a neuter noun, but we're certainly in the genitive singular. The next noun is taremata. Again, remata has that alpha at the end, indicating that it's a uh, neuter, plural, nominative, or accusative, but in this case, we know from the context that it is nominative, from uh, tarema, uh, which means word. Um, and so again, if you were held up, you didn't know what this was, you have ta in front of it, that definite article, which is a neuter plural, either accusative or nominative definite article. So that those are giving you some clues um, as to what those words are, even if you forgot sort of some rules about third declension nouns. Um, and so from there, you can sort of find the subject in the other parts of the sentence and, um, and then lead yourself to a translation, which would be something like, these words of life are coming out or come out of the mouth of our teacher. I just want to, to pause briefly to say again, this sentence would present difficulties if you were trying to translate word for word left from right because the subject of the sentence doesn't occur until some of the last five words. Tauta taremata tes zoes. That is the long phrase that indicates the subject of this sentence. And so um, as you work at sentences, remember that sometimes Greek will put the subject all the way at the very end of a sentence when in English we would expect it to be at the beginning. That is all that uh, we have for lesson 17. Thank you for your attention.